It is a joy. It's a joy to be here again. I um, I want to say two things before I get started. Number one, I love the emphasis on the youth that this church has. You know, I was walking around. I got here early, and I was walking around the church and and um, looking at the library. And then then someone came in. A woman came in, and she said, "Have you seen our youth room?" So she took me downstairs, and I wandered around down there a little bit. And then to hear Pastor Chris talk about the youth group too, it's, it's wonderful, wonderful that the church has an emphasis on the youth and reaching the youth. I worked for 10 years with Child Evangelism Fellowship, and so reaching children and young people is a passion of mine. Um, second thing I want to say is, whether you believe it or not, your social media has an impact. And I say that because every week, when I get a notification that Pastor Chris is live at Glory Baptist, I stop and I pray for your church. So it has an impact. And I love seeing that notification. And, I, and there are times when I watch a bit of the service and see what's going on and listen to Pastor Chris, and I, I love that. It's a connection with the body of Christ. So I wanted to share those two things because I think it's important that you know and understand what speaks to the heart of people. Um, I do work in areas sorry maybe I better not wander too much I do work in areas where it is dangerous to be a Christian but I never consider myself in great danger I don't and I, and I share my name overseas with people I tell them who I am I tell them what I do if they're believers I don't share it with everyone going through the airport. I don't say I'm coming in to, to work with Christians. I don't do that. But My biggest fear is that the work that I do will bring danger to the people I'm working with. That someone will take note there's an American that keeps coming to visit this person and so they must be a Christian because in other countries if you're American, you are a Christian. It's synonymous. And if you're a Christian, then the people you are working with probably are Christians also. This past week, I received a, a group of pictures from a dear friend of mine in, in Morocco, but he had actually been to Mauritania. Mauritania is a country where they passed a law two years ago that if you convert from Islam to Christianity, you will be executed. Before that they gave you the opportunity to change your mind. But now they've made it a law. If you convert from Islam to Christianity, you will be executed. So my friend sent me a group of pictures of believers in Mauritania being baptized. And I know, I know what a blessing it is for those believers, but I also know what great risk they are taking to follow Jesus Christ in baptism. Because in Mauritania, they gather in groups of three or four, not 40 or 50. But at this baptism, there were probably 20 to 25 people that were gathering to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in baptism. <laughs> I do want to speak about the persecuted, but I want to do it through a sermon and, and talking about Matthew 5. And it was interesting because I got here this morning and I went to the Sunday school class and they were just concluding a series on the Beatitudes, which is exactly what I want to speak on today. And hopefully I don't contradict the Sunday school teacher any. Um, I don't think I will after hearing her. Actually, I think we're in complete agreement with what the Beatitudes and what Jesus was teaching to his people. So if you'd open your Bibles to Matthew 5, Starting with verse 1, we're going to go 1 through 12. <clears throat> Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, 
for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray that my words would be your words this morning. I pray that you would speak through me and that that you would speak to each one of our hearts today. Help us to see what you would have us know, Lord. Help us learn what you would have us learn. And then help us go and do what you would have us do. Thank you for this gathering of the body of Christ here at Glory. Pray that you continue to bless them. In your precious name, amen. When I used to think about the Beatitudes, I would think of them as kind of a checklist of things. Either you have them or you don't. Either you're a peacemaker or you're not. Either you're merciful or you're not. Either you're humble or you're not. Either you're pure in heart or you're not. It was kind of a checklist of things I could say, yeah, I got that. No, I don't have that. Yeah, I could, I could see that in my life. Some of them are harder to understand like being pure in heart, how could I ever achieve that? Or being persecuted. But as I studied more about the Beatitudes, and the Sunday school teacher this morning followed the same line of thinking, which is confirmation for me, Jesus was laying out a progression of faith, a step-by-step approach to the Christian faith, And then he goes on in the Sermon on the Mount to explain how to live that out. And I'll explain it this way. The first one starts out with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Many times I've heard this verse quoted, Blessed are the poor, but it's not that. It's blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed is the person who is broken, beyond repair. Blessed is the person who realizes they have fallen so far they cannot get themselves up. That it is impossible for them to do anything on their own to improve their spiritual condition. And they are desperate for something, anything, anyone that will bring them back from the brink of hopelessness. doesn't really sound like someone who's blessed. It sounds like someone who's hit rock bottom. But Jesus is telling the people, you need to get to that place first. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What a promise to follow someone who is broken beyond belief. But Jesus is telling them, you need to get to that place first before I can work in your lives, before God can change your heart. And it follows with, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's not a promise to someone who's lost a loved one. It's not a promise to someone who is grieving the death of a dear family member or the loss of a job or or financial ruin. Although God promises to comfort us in those situations also, I believe what Jesus is saying, we need to mourn for our lostness. We need to mourn for the sin in our lives. We need to be repentant for the things that have separated us from God the Creator. Blessed are those who mourn. In Luke 18, Jesus tells a parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. 
I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Someone is mourning what he has done in his life. You know, I've met people who are broken, broken beyond repair, that nothing they can do will get them out of the despair and the hopelessness that they are in. And many of them come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior at those times. Whether they've been chased away from their homeland because of ISIS, or they have uh, been persecuted for their beliefs, whether they're strong in their faith or not, either you are identified as Muslim or Christian. It says so on your ID card in a lot of countries, depending on what your parents were. And so it might say Christian, even though you're not attending church anywhere and really not living a Christian life, and you will be persecuted because of your parents' faith. But it is that persecution which drives them to a sense of hopelessness and then to a realization that through God there is hope. I've met refugees from Sudan. They've been chased out of Sudan into Egypt because in Sudan, about 11 years ago, uh, maybe less than that, the government basically forced out all Christian organizations. And then the Christians fled also, and they fled, many of them, to Egypt. They estimate that right now in Egypt there are about 5 million Sudanese refugees. They're living in a country that's not their own. They're not allowed to work because they don't belong there. They're not citizens. And so they're reliant upon churches and nonprofit organizations for their housing, for their food, for everything that they get. Maybe they can make a little money on the side doing sewing or cooking or something, but it's not much. They are broken. And yet when I meet with them in their churches, their house churches, when I meet with them in a pastor's house to hear their stories, they talk about how they are blessed by God the Father. And they have the joy of Christ in their eyes as they sing praise to the one who made them, the one who created them, and the one who saved them. Some of them have watched their loved ones killed. Some of them have had their spouses killed in Sudan, and now they're on their own with their children trying to make a living. Some of them have had their spouses kick them out of the house because they chose to follow Christ. And yet they continue to praise God the Father and say that they are blessed. Pray for the Sudanese refugees, please. They're in a desperate situation. Egypt doesn't want them. The Egyptians don't want them there. They're treated as second or third or fourth class citizens. And yet they continue to say that they are blessed. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. See, after you're poor in spirit, after you're broken, and after you mourn the sin in your life, you need to humble yourself before the cross. You need to say, Lord, there's nothing I can do to get myself out of this. It is only through your saving grace that I can be reconnected with God the Father. We need to humble ourselves and get ourselves back on our feet. You know, the parable that Jesus was telling about the tax collector, Jesus doesn't leave it there. He continues. He says, I tell you this, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. What does it mean to be meek? It doesn't mean being intimidated by others. It doesn't mean to be pushed around. Meekness is to reject every thought and action of external coercion, hostility, and violence. 
It is to be gentle, to be kind, and to be empty of all selfish ambition. Before salvation, humility and meekness is an understanding you need a Savior to make your life right. It is humbly calling on God to forgive you for your sins and believing that someone else has to do what you could not do for yourself. And understand, it's a progression. The Beatitudes are a progression of how we live, but we can always fall backwards. We can always sin again in our lives. And again, we need to be sorry for that sin and we need to seek forgiveness for that sin. Not because God has left us, but because we have damaged our relationship with God. We can't do the things that He has planned for us, that He wants us to do, if we're not living a life that it is in perfect step with His walk. So we need to return to mourning for the sin in our lives. After that, it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Once we believed in Jesus Christ, we need to grow. We need to spend time in the Word. We need to seek out people who can mentor us and hold us accountable. We need to hunger and thirst after that which is righteous. I want to ask you, what do you spend your free time on? When you have a four-hour drive, what consumes your thoughts? When you have an afternoon off, what takes up your time? And I'm not saying it has to be all about spending time in the Word and all about thinking godly thoughts. You can't, I'm not saying you can't watch a football game or a movie or listen to music. But what consumes you? What drives you? What can you not wait for to happen next? the next football game, the next season, the next movie that's coming out to the blockbuster that you watched last year. Christ is telling us hunger and thirst after things that are righteous. Then you'll grow. Then you'll be blessed. I want to make sure that I share about each of the people um, there's two young men, two men that I work with. One I talked about in, in Morocco. His name is Brother S. I'll call him Brother S. He's a man of God. He doesn't have much money. But he travels around Morocco and other countries encouraging the believers, training the believers, helping them to grow in their faith and drawing new believers into the body of Christ. Like I said, he doesn't have much, but he uses everything he has, everything he has for the body of Christ. And he'll write to me and say, Dave, I need to go, I need to, go to northern Morocco, or I need to go down to Mauritania, or I need to go to Lebanon, and I can't really swing it right now. Is there some way news service could help me? Every opportunity I get, I help him because I know he's doing what God has called him to do. He hungers and thirsts to see the body of Christ strong and growing. Another man, I'll call him Barry, in our prayer letter he's called Brother Barry. He lives in Mauritania, and I think I might have talked about him last time I was here. He wanted to run a school. He thought he could open a school. He calls it the Son of God School. That's not its official name. His dream was to have 70 students and those students, they would teach Christian values to. Most of the students are Muslim. A few are Christian, but most of them are Muslim. And he thought if he could have this school and teach them Christian values and build relationships with their families, then I could share the gospel with their families and draw more people to Christ. I've been to his school twice the last two years. He has over 700 students. And I thought, that's wonderful. Brother Barry's doing miraculous work. And he is developing relationships with the families. And through the families, he is sharing the gospel. So Brother Barry also runs house churches. 
Not one house church. He has his own house church. But he is also raising up leaders to run other house churches because his school has allowed him to lead others to Christ. And these house churches are springing up in a country where if you convert from Islam to Christianity, you will be executed. He hungers and thirsts after righteousness. Everything he has is poured back into how can I serve God better? What more can I do to reach people? What more can I do? We allowed the school, we helped pay for the school to have running water. They had had no running water. So we paid for them to get running water. Brother Barry turned around and told the community around the school, we have water here now. If you need water for your homes, come here and get it. So rather than having to go a long distance or pay someone to bring it to their homes, the homes around the school can now go to the school and get water. You think that doesn't show Christ's love to the community? People ask Barry, why are you like that? Why are you that way? What makes you different than all the other Arabs that we deal with? What makes you different than all the other Mauritanians that we work with? And so we can share the love of Christ with people. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. See, the first four Beatitudes teach us how to reconnect with God and grow in our faith. But the last four challenge us. They make us move beyond that. To be merciful. You know, it's real easy for me to be merciful to, say, my brother, my family members, my friends. They do something against me. I can forgive them. But mercy is more than forgiveness. Mercy is more than forgiveness to my loved ones, especially. I've met many believers who are shining examples of what it means to be merciful. Women who have endured terrible humiliation, yet they forgive their tormentors. Men who have been imprisoned, tortured, treated like they are worthless, yet they care about the people who have treated them that way. They show mercy. Can you... You see, God gives us hearts of mercy for everyone to see others the way that God sees them. Either they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior or as God's creation, they still need to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. A pure heart has no hypocrisy, no selfish motivation for what we do. Everything we do should be for the glory of God. Not what can I get out of this, not, not how will this further my career, not how will this give me better standing within the community. Can you think of a day in your life when you didn't have something going on that had a hidden agenda, a motive. I can. I mean, I do something nice for my wife and I think, you know, points. Good points on my side. I do something good at church and, and I look for affirmation. It's not always, always about hidden agendas, but it's really easy to have something in our heart that's not quite pure. Jesus is challenging the people who are listening to him to be without selfish ambition, to be open and honest about everything you're doing and why you're doing it. And then your light will shine before men. See, the Beatitudes are calling us to be more and more Christ-like. And I believe as we become more and more Christ-like, 
we become one of two things to people. Either we draw them to Jesus Christ or we offend them deeply. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. woman that I met in Egypt last year works with the Sudanese. She's Egyptian, so that right away kind of sets her apart from the other Egyptians because she loves and cares for the Sudanese. She spends her days visiting family after family after family of Sudanese refugees, finding out what they need and how she can help them. She has no motivation that is selfish. She seeks nothing for herself. I asked her the other day, about two weeks ago, Iman, how do you pay for the work that you do? She said, I've been doing it for three years now and God has always provided. She doesn't have any organization behind her. Um, when I go over there, I help her with what I can. But she survives day to day doing the work that God has called her to do. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Another one that's difficult to understand because a peacemaker isn't just a middle child who seeks to fix the squabbles within his family. A peacemaker is someone who steps outside of their own comfort zone to bring peace to the world. To bring peace in situations where it might not be in my best interest to make peace. But I long to see Christ glorified and so I'm going to step out and bring peace in this situation. Let me give you an example. In the Gaza Strip, There aren't very many Christians, about 500 Christians in, a, in an area of two and a half million people. One of those believers about 10 years ago was a man by the name of Hana Masad, Pastor Hana. He was the pastor of the Baptist Church in the Gaza Strip. One of his good friends was working at a Bible bookstore in the Gaza Strip. And they started receiving threats, closed down the Bible bookstore. And they kept selling Bibles, they kept selling Christian material. And one night a bomb went off in the Bible bookstore. Rami, this Christian who was running the Bible bookstore, fixed up the shop and started selling Bibles again. Now understand, Pastor Hannah's wife was in charge of the Bible bookstore. So he and Rami were very good friends. A few weeks later, Rami's wife received a phone call from Rami saying, I'm sorry, honey, but I won't be home for a while. They found Rami's body the next day. He had been executed. They found out there, there was a list of Christians who were targeted to be killed in the Gaza Strip by Hamas and by the terrorists there. Pastor Hanna was like number two or number three on that list. And so Pastor Hanna took his family and fled from the Gaza Strip. He lives in the U.S. now. He's a missionary. But he goes back to the Gaza Strip two to three times a year to preach the gospel to the Muslims who hated him. He's a peacemaker. Despite what it could mean for him and his safety, he wants to see Jesus Christ brought to these people. And he prays for their salvation. And he brings clothing and he brings food because in the Gaza Strip, most of the people are broke. They have nothing. And he shows Christ's love to the people who hated him. Finally, I need to wrap this up. Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And he, 
ends with the same promise the first one had. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, the more we become Christ-like, the more offensive we will become to the society around us. In the Middle East and North Africa, all that means is the moment you receive Christ as your Savior, you're offensive to the world around you. As soon as you believe in Jesus Christ and call yourself a Christian, you are offensive to all the majority of people around you. In America, it's a little harder than that because, because our country was founded on Christian values and principles. Because doing good is, is an American thing, not just a Christian thing. Because being kind to others and helping the poor is something that we do as a nation, not only as Christians. Here, to be offensive, to be Christ-like, and to really feel what it means to be persecuted means we have to go a step further. We need to stand up and be what Christ has called us to be. To show Christ's love to the world around us without any selfish ambition, without any hope for gain for ourselves, to do what God has called us to do in a way that we will stand out far and above, either as offensive or as in drawing others to Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean we're judgmental to the world around us. It doesn't mean we stand up and, and call them for their sins because they don't know Jesus Christ. We can't hold them to the same standard. What it means is opening up our arms and loving the world around us in such a way that Jesus Christ is shown to them. doesn't mean accepting what is wrong, but it means loving them the way that Jesus Christ would love them. Trying to draw them to the Father the way that Jesus Christ would look, do. And in doing so, we will become more Christ-like, and we will become more offensive and ultimately we will be persecuted. You know, Scripture tells us any who truly desire to follow Christ will be persecuted. So the question is, do we believe Scripture or don't we? It's a promise in the Bible. And I would say, if people aren't... I heard this this morning too, something very similar. If people aren't questioning your motivation... If people aren't questioning what you say and do, are you truly sharing Christ's love and Christ's gospel to the world around you? Because either you are drawing them to Christ or you are offending them with the gospel. Please pray for the persecuted. This past week I heard about 10 Nigerians who were executed I don't think it's been verified yet, but a video was released by one of the terrorist groups. There are bombings taking place, there are people being killed, and now recently, um, with the killing of, of the Iraqi general, I fear for the Christians in Iran and Iraq, I mean the Iranian general, because it will become a whole new surge of persecution against them. So, I will end with that and I'll ask Pastor if he could come back up here. Thank you and God bless. I do ask that you fill out, it's not a newsletter, it's a prayer letter. It's stories about the persecuted that you can pray for monthly and they are, they are in desperate need of prayer. So please, pray for the persecuted. Thank you. And, the, and thank you as well, Brother Dave. Let's give Brother Dave a hand for sharing with us today.